Thanks very much, Gary. Um, welcome, everybody. Greetings. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to session two of 24 Hours for Palestine, mm. titled Palestinian Artists in the Global Diaspora. My name is Catherine Corey, she, her, and I'm speaking to you from my home in northern Manhattan, the land of the Lenape people. It's my honor today to bring together three artists, activists, and entrepreneurs with whom I've had the pleasure of working. Writer-performer Braida Taha, actor-translator, business leader Ias Yunus, and writer-director, actor, and professor Ali Halidi to talk about their work, their passions, their activism, and their thoughts on and responses to the current and ongoing circumstances in their country of origin. Before we begin our conversation, it gives me Great joy to introduce my friend Braid the Taha first, who will honor us by reading an original text that, that will tell you volumes about her activism, her scope, and her integrity. Dedicated media professional, writer, and theater actress with a proven track record of creating compelling and original scripts, Braida has worked in Palestinian media alongside many prominent Palestinian figures. She has utilized all her talents and experiences in media, culture, and acting to serve the Palestinian cause and to convey the Palestinian voice to various parts of the world through her plays, which have toured internationally and received significant attention in both Arab and global outlets. And now, Raida Taha reading her piece, The Significance of the Palestinian Narrative in Collective Memory Through Theater. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, so I can start now, right? Please um, do. Good evening. I am so uh, honored to to uh, be part to join this uh, wonderful really amazing uh, uh, project and I, I thank you all for the opportunity that you have given me. Thank you, Catherine, uh, for your wonderful uh, words. Um, I would have rather uh, read this piece, to be honest with you, in Arabic, not in English. Uh, but since uh, a lot of people are watching, uh, from all over the world, so uh, I will read it. I will read the English version, and don't mind the editing. It's still a work in progress. Um, so, the committee. Yes, the citizen. I am so and so, the committee. You have no name. The citizen. My father is so and so, the committee. You have no family, the citizen. This is my application. It has all the required documents and certificates with my photo atop, smiling for a bright future. Committee, you have no application. I want to be a soldier, the citizen said. You have no fight left. The citizen, a sailor. You have no ship, the committee. You have no readers, a writer. You have no readers. I will, I will, I will, I, I will turn as a as a, as a Bedouin to the desert. The citizen said, "You have no tribe, a palm tree. You have no roots. I will become a fighter. You have no cause. I will fight. There is no adversary. I will be, I will be killed. You have no grave. I will scream in the roads. You have no voice." I will live on dreams. You have no dreams. On memories. You have no memories. I will become a Sufi. You have no monastery. I, a, a radical Marxist. You have no comrades. A Muslim. You have no Kaaba. A Christian. You have no church. A Jew. We will look into it. This is a piece written by Muhammad al Maghout. And the name of the book is the title of the book, I Will Betray My Country. I say enough. This is not just a statement, but also 
a call to accumulate action to keep the embers of multifaceted resistance with multi-mechanisms burning. For the challenge lies in keeping it glowing while widening its radiance. Each one of us has a challenge. If one is free of despair and pessimism, without that, civilizations and homelands wouldn't have been built. Some may say it's too late to indulge in a fantasy of victory and prosperity. Others respond, if there is someone who can materialize fantasy, then nothing is impossible. By the way, I'm talking about Palestine, my Palestine. We as a people and individuals, Palestinians and Arabs, are victims of the Zionist lie rooted in the Western mentality. It is a lie that has obscured the fact about the historical existence of Palestinians in their land and has completely ignored all the values and morals that were established as a basis for protecting humanity and limiting the ability of man to commit brutal crimes against their fellow man. However, these values and ethics do not include Palestinians. We were deliberately excluded from that humane balance, robbed of everything with which we could restore our humanity. So it was we, not our occupiers, who became the greatest victim in contemporary history. We were and still are victims of lies that have been thrown at us ever since the Zionist settler colonialist project was established at the expense of an entire people, entire people, blood still flows fresh and bright before the eyes of the world. Here, I will mention some of the lies that Israel fabricated to legitimize its largest robbery in history. Very important to mention that for people who do not know or who are aware now of these lies, but some are not probably. Lie. Jews were persecuted in the Arab world. Jews were not subjected to any persecution in Arab countries. They prospered in the Arab world since ancient times, um, occupying senior positions since the Abbasid era and Abbasid era, Abbasid era, and the Andalusian, يعني, and the Andalusian era until its fall in the 15th century. On the other hand, Jews were historically persecuted in Europe, while Nazi Germany was not, Nazi Germany was not their only persecutor. It was not us who committed, it was not us who committed such crimes. I think somebody is trying to talk to me about this. No. It was, it was not us who committed sickening crimes of murder, gassing, burning, and dissolving Jews. Rather, it was the West where such atrocities were committed against them and which exported its crisis to us deeming us target, targets. To this day, we still pay the price for a crime we never committed, never. Since inception, the Zionist propaganda machine has been promoting the idea of return, that is, the return of the Jews to Palestine, and that it's written in the Old Testament. So, support for Israel is backed mainly by religious faith of Westerners. Zionist literature on a promised land in the 19th century was based on a rather fertile imagination, disinformation, and a politicized interpretation of the Torah. There is no shortage of documented evidence until now refuting this lie that remains promoted. Through such falsification, the Zionist movement denies the existence of an indigenous Palestinian people on their land. Legend says, a land without a people for a people without a land. I'm sure you all know this. 
The objective of this lie is to strip the Palestinian people of their history, identity, heritage, land, customs, and traditions, humanity, dignity, in order and dignity in order to implement the settler colonial project that was created over the bodies of an entire people. It denies all this despite the fact that in 1922, the population was 757,182 Palestinians, 182 Palestinians, and 38,649 European Jews. Whereas when the infamous State of Israel was established in 1948, the population was circa 2 million Palestinians and 650,000 European Jews. Lie. We go back to lies. Peaceful coexistence. There was no chance for peaceful coexistence in light of the massacres and crimes committed at the hands of the Zionist terrorist gangs, the Haganah, Ergon, and Stern. There is over 75 massacres documented between 1937 and 1948 and over 15 or more massacres from 1967 to the present day. Culminated by six massacres in Gaza only within 2011, 2012 to this day, not counting October 7 in, in 2023. We have everyday massacres. We wake up on massacres in Gaza. More often than not, I ask myself, how does history begin for individuals in the early childhood years? And how does this affect memory? Despite the numerous documented examples, I will resort, resort to my childhood and to some of the situations and memories ingrained in my mind revolving around one deprivation after the other, which always present themselves to me as a flashback. Number one, the first one. It was in Jerusalem, Ras al-Amut, 1967. From my bed, I see my father Ali Taha as he hides important documents in the chain, basically silisle in Arabic. It, uh, it uh, comprises stones lined up and piled up to form a wall separating the surrounding houses. He smoothly pulls out a medium-sized stone, inserts a nylon bag, and puts the stone back in position. He turns right and left and walks back into the house. Several days later, excuse me, a storm blows in Jerusalem collapsing several stones from the wall, and the nylon bag falls. I rush to my father, hold his hand, and whisper, quick, quick, get the documents before the Israelis arrive. That was not a sense of humor or wit. Rather, a very early sense of danger. My father was involved, as many of his generation were, in the Arab nationalist movement. Harakat al-Qawmiyin al-Arab. Clandestine work was a prevalent requirement at that era, while anxiety was overwhelming. During the 1967 war, the neighbors and we hid in a cave in Ras al-Amud. This is the second story. In Ras al-Amud in Jerusalem. I remember the sounds of military aircrafts, women praying, children crying, and the man responsible for screaming at the top of his lungs each time a plane passed overhead. In Bitah, lie on your face. Everyone would lie down flat in total silence. None of this will flee my memory. Another story, when my aunt Abla was arrested in 1967, Afwan, sorry, excuse me, in 1968, upon her attempt to smuggle a suitcase packed with explosives from the Alambi Bridge to Jerusalem. I couldn't bear for my father to visit her in prison without me. I was strongly attached to her as we lived together with my grandmother, uh, Suraya. I'm the eldest daughter and I have the largest share of pampering and attention. I would sleep next to her at night 
sometimes accompany her to visit relatives and steal the radio for her every morning from my father's bedside so she can tune in the, into the news on Saut Al Arab channel. As soon as my father would open his eyelids, he'd scream, Raida, bring the radio. I did not stop crying when she was arrested until I went along with my father to Al Maskobiya prison for a visit before her trial. I did not, it was a cold morning and I had a yellow wool dress on. We arrived in a courtyard and I saw my aunt behind an iron mesh, pressing her face to it, calling me. Raida. I let go of my dad's hand and ran towards her. Auntie, auntie, amto, amto. I returned to my father screaming, daddy, auntie. Then I quickly returned to her and repeat, auntie, auntie. This hysterical sprinting went on for several minutes until she said, come my love, come for a kiss. So I ran to the iron mesh and began kissing whatever I could touch of her among the small mesh squares, soaked with her warm, salty tears. I want my aunt, open the door. I started running between the iron mesh and the gate. Open the door, I want to see my aunt, open the door. It was useless. I couldn't stand it. I didn't understand. All I wanted was to hug her. My father ripped my hands off the mesh as I cried, Auntie! She was crying and screaming too. Let her in, you criminals, let her in! To no avail. To no avail either. Aren't emotional incidents like this supposed to linger in the memory of a little girl? I began the documentation phase and utilized it in theater for a pressing need within me. <clears throat> my mind and my heart, to free myself of the feeling of injustice that grows and intensifies over time. It is that perpetuating uninterrupted feeling of injustice in our Palestinian cause for more than 75 years, which creates the need to express it in various manifestations, to say, we are still here, we remain steadfast, we utilize all means to preserve our existence, protect our history and heritage, and prolong our survival, whatever the cost. The tools may be plenty, but the goal is but one, liberty, liberating the land and the narrative. My own narrative is a reflection of the public narrative for separating uh, a Palestinian from her people's reality and cause is impermissible. I am Palestine, and Palestine is me. Palestine is my identity that I exercise and express through my options, choices, and dialogue. Regarding my work as a writer and actress, I always strive to shed light on several stages of the history of the Palestinian struggle and its myriad of aspects on the socio-political life of the Palestinians and on stories from 1967 and 1948 through which I summarize main events whose consequences still accompany us to this day. Prior to discussing my work, I wish here to delve a little into the pre-Nakba history of Palestinian theater movement. And this is defying the saying that says, People without a land for a land without the people and all this horrible lies, all these horrible lies. Yes, we had a pre-Nakba history of Palestinian theater movement. Palestinian theater began to prosper well before 1948 with missionary schools spreading all over Jerusalem, Haifa, Jaffa, and Bethlehem, where they, along with Palestinian clubs and associations, planted the seeds to, of renaissance in theater. Among those clubs was the YMCA in Jerusalem, found, founded in 1877. Among the prominent script writers, script writers between 1919 and 1949 were Jamil Habib al-Bahri, 
the Saliba brothers and Nasri, Jamil and Farid al Juzi. Between 1920 and 1930, national schools were established to focus on theater, while Egyptian, Levantine, Levantine and foreign troops that visited Palestine played an important role in that renaissance. Among the most prominent of these troops were George Abiyat, Rehani, Ali al Kassar, and Ali al Kassar troops. Additionally, foreign troops performed plays by Shakespeare and Moliere. Can you believe it? Encouraging the youth to establish their own troops in Jerusalem and in several cities of up to 30 of them, alibied their weak performances. During the British mandate, during the British mandate, Palestinian theater did not shy away from political themes. Despite the oppression, censorship, and dire circumstances, it played an important role in awareness raising until they were interrupted by the 1948 Nakba. Everything was interrupted by the 1948 Nakba, by the way. One of its disastrous results was the dispersion of artists, thus disrupting the gradual cumulative rise in Palestine's theater. After that, between 1948 and 1967, among the prominent troops renowned were the Babis, Popular Theater, Balalin, Modern Theater, Kashkul, and the National Theater Troops. Post-1967, uh, a new generation of script writers were behind a bunch of theatrical works in the West Bank and other parts of Palestine. A group of, a group of Palestinian writers and poets also shined through works characterized by depth and, char and charm in, descri in describing an uh, Uspert Palestine, such as Karakish by Samih al Qasim, and I witnessed that, I know him very well, The Zunj Revolution and Samson and Delilah by Mu'in Ibseso, and I also was present when Mu'in Ibseso was there, God bless their souls. The Question, a poetic play by Harun Hashim al Rashid, The Door and the Hat by Ghassan Kanafani, and The Palestine Dream by Rashad Abu Shawar. He is a friend of Rashad. After the 1993 Oslo Accords, the theater movement remains ongoing. Be it in the 1948 parts, the West Bank, or the diaspora, albeit intermittently, in spite of all the oppression and persecution inflicting on our people. Currently in Palestine, I also performed in that era. I am, uh, you know, I came through the Oslo Agreement, unfortunately, but I went back to Palestine. Currently in Palestine, there are over 15 theater houses spread across the 1948 parts, the West Bank, and Jerusalem. Theater is an influential tool in preserving a national and perhaps personal identity and in, in saving it as an heirloom for Posterity. It is a device for artistic preservation with which we resist marginalization and deprivation of our natural rights to exercise our humanity. Hence, I preserve to ensure that my experience and my life, both public and private, are part of the aggregate Palestinian memory. According to Palestinian writer, Abad Yahya, memory is place, time, language, identity, approach, methodology, politics, economy, and society. Narrative lies within its truth, which is based on a historical build-up extending over several millennia. It is not illusions or myths, rather actual historical facts. Memory, still according to Yahya, is an actual slice of the Palestinian narrative, and they are inseparable. 
as they both confirm Palestinians' right to their land and refute the claimed Zionist narrative. Our narratives must also contain creative and aesthetic elements of other cathedrals, diaspora, wars, asylum, the Nakba, and all the massacres that our people suffered and that we still experience today. There is room for everyone to tell the numerous stories that have not been yet narrated. The narratives, however, must be presented in an entertaining form, far from cliches and outdated styles saturated with overused slogans. We must break the stereotype of Palestinians. Let's avoid reducing it to a hatta and stones lopped at soldiers, for we do not exist merely to fight. For we have work to do in our land. We have the past here. We have the first cry of life. We have the present, the present and the future. We have this world here and the hereafter. Those who pass between fleeting words. This is a piece by, Draida, <clears throat> Draida, it's Catherine. Hi, uh, your uh, microphone is it's shuffling a little bit and uh, you need to speak more directly so that we can uh, hear you better. Okay. We don't want to miss a word. Okay. So, <clears throat> I conclude this with a brief, I conclude this with a brief overview of what I do in my work. In my first play, where will I find someone like you, Ali? Antigone materializes in the person of my aunt Suhaila. Suhaila is one of the Antigone women who populated Palestine from 1936 to the present day. They are mothers, sisters, and wives who give birth to heroes. They are heroines. So Haila says, I promised myself that I would never cover up, neither in summer nor winter, until I bring back your father out of the cold and darkness and bury him. My father Ali Taha was martyred in 1972 during the hijacking of Belgian plane, the Sabena, and redirecting it to forcibly land at the Lut airport in Palestine. Ehud Barak and Benjamin Netanyahu killed him and kidnapped his body. The play sheds light on illiterate Suhaila who remained restless until she freed her brother's body that had been frozen in the Zionist enemy refrigerators for two years. She said, I will never rest or have peace of mind until I free your father and bury him so that when you return to Palestine, you visit him. This is what she told me. The play depicts socio-political life, the experience of resisting the occupation in, 1970s, in the 70s, and the circumstances that martyrs women underwent with their children who endured being orphaned and deprived. It depicts heroism, the resulting pain, and the political slogans that played an overarching arching role in shaping the Palestinians' character at large. The play also depicts that the determination of Palestinian women, exemplified in Suhaila, to regain their rights within a framework work of patriarchal society. So Hila's brothers had blamed her, trying to deter her un under the pretext that what she was doing was a male prerogative. So she resisted revolting against her family until she achieved her objectives. So Hila managed to free her brother. To this day, 52 years later, she still carries his picture in her necklace and she sees in him a hero that her grandchildren should emulate. The second play, 36 Abbas Street, Haifa, 
encapsulates the right of return upon the 1948 Nakba through the story of two families, the Abu Ghaidas and the Arrafas. Sarah Jude Arrafa, a former prisoner from Jerusalem, the old city, from Aqabat Darwish, she married Ali Arrafa, the Hifawi lawyer, the lawyer who comes from Haifa, on one condition, I would not give up Jerusalem unless for a small house by the sea. I just love the sea. It rejuvenates my heart. So Ali purchased a house from an Austrian Jew overlooking the sea from the third floor. Little did she not that the property, little did she not know that the property had belonged to Abu Ghaidas, who were forcefully expelled from it and had lived in the diaspora. Sarah, Nidal's mother, never quit reminding her five children, I will never change a, stra a thing in this place. If it needs little pain, touch-ups here and there, fine. If it needs minor repairs, fine. But to actually remodel or refurbish it is a no-go. When the homeowners eventually return, they can renovate as they wish. Her daughter Nidal grew up with this mantra until one day, fate brought her together with Dina, the homeowner's granddaughter. None of them was alive. Then, but her uncle Fuad Abu Ghaida, a football star in the 1960s, Egypt. Nidal flew to London and convinced him and his wife to return to Haifa and restore the house. This took place in an unforgettable celebration at 36 Abbas Street, where Fuad received the house key from Ali Rafa and Lulations, Lulations, Lululululi, <laughs> and applauses were, uh, were cheerfully loud. Israelis hung their flag on balconies in fear and protest, overshadowing victorious rejoice over the, return, over the return and the rightful homeowners to their property was prevalent, overshadowing the resentment and unease between Nidal and Dina Abu Ghaida, for the latter blamed Nidal for robbing her the right to live in her home, neighborhood, and environment. You know something, Nidal? This street could have been my street. This school could have been my school. These friends of yours were my friends, and this entire life that you live is my life. The place acts describe post-Nakba life in Haifa. They portray the sea, the odors, the colors of, the, of nature and life, the customs, immigrants confronting Israelis, and the struggle to unveil the truth to unveil the truth at various levels. They visualize the most painful part of all, the indigenous people's regret for leaving the homeland behind. The third play, The Fig Tree. This play addresses concepts of contemplation, recollection, the search for memories, and the clinging to that which remains, clinging to that which remains. It is about scattered memories of a woman who lived part of her childhood in the Damascus Gate. The hum and drawer of war planes during the 1967 war, the Afghani corner, Zawi al Afghani, the Ala Eddin Gate, the Sesame Candies, Abu Shukri's Hummus, Zalatimus Mutabak, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Kriset Li Yamin. Via Dolorosa, Tariq Al Alam, Al Aqsa Courtyard, Bas Basti Cafe. She realized that her parents, Ali and Fathiye, practically own Jerusalem's soul and memories. And hence, she inherits all this from them. These are memories of a woman exhausted by feeling of alienation from her Jerusalem, felt discriminated. I returned to Palestine with a heart empty of memories, embraces, family ties, holidays, anniversary, 
tearful beginnings of academic years, forming friendships, school breaks, seasons of olives, apricots, and grapes, a lost return address, and an empty birdcage. I return with a mind void of all sorts of joy and pain, cousins' weddings, Debke and Mawawil classes, the Intifada, the demonstrations, the political leaflets, the arrests, the chasings, our neighbors' cooking aroma, the hwerne dish, cats that sank in trash bins, and the herbalist market. Quote, I inherited fragmented memories passed on from a single mother, passed on from a single mother who lost her lover, giving up his life to Jerusalem. That Jerusalem, that ghul which devours her children, that Jerusalem whose history Ali memorized with passion, he used to love her, to talk about her with longing and a single tear. She had charmed him with love. She kidnapped him. She bewitched him. He gave her, her, he gave her his life. He wore her soul and was buried under the warmth of her chest. That's how I remember myself as a young girl. Confused, unsure, tense, and troubled. Born in Jerusalem, I grew up in the diaspora, in diaspora, inherited memories, and returned home burdened with contradictions of alienations. I desperately searched for roots of belonging, of which I was forcibly deprived. To this day, my name is Ra'ida the Returnee, Ra'ida Al-Aida. My third play, Ghazal Akka, Chapters from the Life of Ghassan Kanafani, is a narration of chapters from the life of a young man born in Akka of the 1930s, whose short life witnessed a stormy and turbulent journey spanning forced displacement becoming a refugee and resisting injustice, ultimately ending in his assassination. He lived the life of a freedom fighter, as a writer, a literary figure, a journalist, a critic, a children's author, as well as a talented painter who continued to love life to the fullest. He was brutally assassinated at the age of 36. He is Ghassan Kanafani. As its title indicates, the Ghazal Akka of Akka is a narration of chapters from the life of a young man born in Akka of the 1930s. His short life witnessed a stormy and turbulent journey spanning forced displacement. Becoming a refugee and his assassination, he spent his life of struggle as a writer, journalist, critic, and writer, a writer of children's stories, like I said, and the creative painter who loved life, until he was assassinated at 36 years old. His name remained an icon of history. He is Ghassan Kanafani. He is our icon. Ghassan had diabetes at 23 years old. He would say, as not dead yet, and as long as I am alive, I'm still alive, I shall not consider myself ill. It was his personal challenge. Henceforth, when we are expelled from our homeland and deprived of harvesting our land, kneading our bread, feeding the livestock, and eating under the trees, not only will nostalgia push our return, but our hearts will ignite with anger, resistance, and revolution. The way I see it, Theater is a means of resistance. With it, I resist the Zionist narrative that always seeks to rewrite our history on our behalf. We are truly sick and tired of such narrative that's built that's built on lies and of the exclusive influence it still has over the Palestinian narrative in Western perception. It is high time for the entire world to receive our narrative. 
my works are merely a contribution to writing parts of the Palestinian narrative and an attempt to consolidate, consolidate collective memory with expressive tools that depict the dynamic human place relationship in a format that can be described as aesthetic. My objective here is to awaken the will to hold on to our right, belonging, culture, and civilization. This is not merely to archive the collective memory, but rather to reject status quo, which also under the threat of theft away from its historical context. Through our narrative, we take back our homeland, prosperous and populated. We take back our sea and mountains. Our narrative depicts dance and tears, the scent of a mother's milk, of mother's milk, and horses that do not sleep. It brings back a girl playing in a yard, content with a doll, with a doll, and the sounds of prayers, with swooshing wind, and the color of soil. The narrative brings back our stolen life, shining with brilliant colors. Such, such is my narrative on stage, free of injustice and tyranny. Thank you very much. And excuse all the mistakes I made, but I was really touched and excited about this uh, project that you have, 24 Hours Palestine. Thank you so much, Raida. It's, uh, I can't express uh, how um, much perspective I have just from hearing you say those words. It's Thank really you. amazing. Um, and knowing your work as I do and through the conversations we've had over the past years, I know how essential it is for you to tell what you know to be the truth about Palestine and Palestinians through your writing and performing. Yes. Uh, I'd like to follow up in a minute, but first it's my pleasure to introduce our other two speakers whom I want to bring into the room. Yeah. So Aliyah Halidi is a director, uh, actress, university lecturer and trainer. Currently, she teaches the history of Arabic theater and stage directing at Lebanese American University in Beirut. Among many productions, she directed Makhluta, a devised play on mental health and awareness for Doctors Without Borders, performed at the Burj al Barajna Palestinian refugee camp. And in 2016, she wrote and directed Anbara, based on the autobiography of the early Arab feminist, Anbara Salam Haladi, which was chosen to represent Lebanon at the Journée de Carthage in Tunis. Alia has acted in many plays, most recently in a play entitled Ayube, directed by Awad Awad, based on the lives of Palestinian women in Lebanese refugee camps. And she is the founder and artistic director of the Foundation for Arab Dramatic Arts. Welcome, Alia. And E.S. Yunus is a prolific actor, writer, and entrepreneur. After completing his MBA program, which he funded by teaching martial arts and ballroom dancing, E.S. held various corporate positions in New York City and the Middle East. His passion for acting and writing led him to study drama and audition for roles in films. And after appearing in several productions, E.S. quit his successful corporate job in 2012 to pursue his acting career in the United States. In 2024, E.S. officially, um, ES officially launched his casting platform, Casting Arabia, the first of its kind in the MENA region. This platform offers a centralized hub for casting calls, job postings, and networking possibilities, and empowers artists in acting, singing, dancing, modeling, and other creative fields to showcase their skills, connect with industry professionals, and discover their next big break. Yes, Eunice. Thank you all for being here with me. I really appreciate it. Um, Raida, um, so I, I have questions for all of you. And um, I want to start with Raida to follow up on, on what you read. And just, I guess, I'd love to know a little bit more about when or how you discovered that making theater was the most fulfilling and promising way to share the Palestinian experience and tell clear-eyed and personal stories of the occupation and illuminate Palestinian creativity and artistry. Hearing about theater in Palestine pre-Nakba, that was incredible. That was mind-blowing for me. So could you talk a little bit about how you got started telling your stories this way? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, uh, I had this talent since I was like five, five years old or maybe less. 
Um, I discovered that at a later stage uh, of my life, really, because as I worked as the press secretary of uh, um, uh, Yasser Arafat, um, God bless his soul, um, I was supposed to learn the diplomatic talk. I was supposed to be a real good diplomat. And I failed in doing that. I'm a very blunt person. I cannot lie and cannot change the truth. Um, well, diplomacy is an art also, uh, an art of lying probably, or sugarcoating the, the, the ugly truth. Um, and I, I really tried, I think, I, I, should, I should confess that Yasser Arafat was a bit disappointed. He tried so hard with me. He said, you have all what it takes to become the youngest ambassador uh, 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 the, the youngest Palestinian ambassador, but this tongue of yours, I mean, needs to be really cut. And I took that as a compliment because um, I, was, I, I was really um, attached to him. He, he could do it, like he could do it uh, like this. I mean, it, it, it was no problem for him. But for me, it was a big problem. And then I discovered that if you can't be a revolutionary in that sense, diplomatic revolutionary, be an artist. And I, uh, <laughs> made, I realized my dream. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Oh, you know, Eos, um, since we first spoke back in 2015 and I learned just a little about your background, I've been deeply impressed uh, by the way you have incorporated your talent, your multiple skill sets, an entrepreneurial spirit to illuminate Arab and especially Palestinian stories, also through your remarkable translation skills, and lift up actors, Arab actors and, and, and artists. Uh, we'll talk about your amazing platform, Casting Arabia, in a moment. But first, could you talk about your specific background? I, If I'm not mistaken, you grew up in Jordan, correct? And yes, and, 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 and did you discover theater in Jordan? Uh, or wanting to do film when you were in Jordan. I mean, I guess this the title of this um, session is Palestinian Artists in the Global Diaspora. And what I'm hearing from people all over the place is that you never stop really being Palestinian. Am I correct about that? You're still Palestinian <laughs> and <laughs> wherever you live and wherever you grew up. And uh, so if you could talk a little bit about um, starting in theater in Jordan or what happened? Talk to us. Well, I wasn't as fortunate as these ladies to start and you with uh, with the theater. For me, it was more, uh, there was no, I, I don't think in Jordan was uh, ever developed fully in terms of theater or but, uh, for me growing up with theater, actually it felt, I probably others can relate, is less serious, is more where the comedy and like you see all the theater plays like the Egyptians and Syrian. And for for me, it was more like TV and film. I, as you said, and you said it perfectly, I, I, I wasn't really thinking that I could do anything in the world of art, pro probably because Jordan was uh, kind of developed in that area when I grew up there. And coming from an academic family, it was always just the usual Palestinian mentality. It's like be a doctor or be an engineer or be something like that. So um, went through the masters in New York and doing all mm -hmm. that stuff. So, so it wasn't really developed. But I guess if you're an actor or an artist in general, those things always resonate with you, even if you without you practicing them. So you're always like I everyone knew since I was a kid that I when I watch a movie, I if it's a good movie, I leave knowing most of the script by heart. And, and my father was always because I'm the least academic in the family and he would be like, oh, that you're good. That's you're good with memorizing movies, but your own school homework, that's a challenge for you, isn't it? So and now it's paying <laughs> off. I can I can audition on the same day and memorize like three pages so uh, it's working well for me but the decision came a little bit later with that but I I as the definition of of us being abroad even yesterday someone was like so how do you define yourself I'm Palestinian from Jordan it's like an American well yeah that that too <laughs> right 
Uh, but the, I mean, I my acting was mostly I tried a little bit in Jordan where I did like I think two features or two shorts and one feature and one commercial and stuff. But I really developed as an actor more in in the United States. Like been I think since 2012 I moved and I started acting almost right away. Been in like 20. Two primetime TV shows of probably 43 or 44 projects overall. Been a good and run. Speaking of that, though, um, this is something you and I have touched on that I would really like to hear about. I mean, um, as an actor and entrepreneur now in the United <clears throat> States, I want to hear about your experience dealing with Western or American perspectives on <clears throat> Palestinian Arab stories, artists, culture. Uh, as an actor, um, what has been your experience with regard to casting? And what and your response to the kind of roles you've been asked to audition for? I'd love to hear about that. Well, it's it's funny that when I decided I decided to quit the job, like I quit my job and sold the car, sold the furniture, and everything. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go to the United States and act. And everyone's yeah. and the the joke that at the time was like, oh, so what are you gonna be? Uh, what are you gonna play in Hollywood? The terrorist number six. And that was the joke at the time. And I was like, I will never play a terrorist. It was like, yeah, good luck in Hollywood. And it actually worked. I never played a terrorist ever. And I, my agent and manager, they always know. It's like, I that don't ever bring it up. Uh, the last agent I got he, in the meeting, he was like, well, we respect that. But let's, hypothetically speaking, if Mel Gibson has a new movie, it's like, I'm going to save you the time if... The, if it's a blockbuster movie and my supporting actor is Tom Cruise, the answer is no, if it's a terrorist role. So if that's a problem, I'll get up now. It's like, no, no, let's talk. It's fine. And I just never liked the idea. And, and it's, it's specifically speaking about Palestinians and being seen in that, in that view. Um, there is probably organized, uh, like uh, intentional, way of, of productions of making us look Arabs in general, but Palestinians specifically from movies like uh, off the top of my head, Munich, uh, The Spy, and obviously Fauda, which is, I even met Brazilians in Mexico who were like, yeah, we love Fauda. They have no idea about anything. And I couldn't get myself to watch it, but they, when you ask them, it's like, did you know that the Palestinians were the indigenous people of the land by watching the TV show? It's like, no, no one touches on that. We don't know what you're talking about. So by it's intentionally an agenda that is really feeding that. So they didn't want to be part of it. But also, on the other hand, we're not creating what is needed in order for us to change that. A few uh, initiatives like uh, obviously, I'm not talking about theater. Uh, I, my world is a different world. But initiatives like what Alia and Raida and many others are doing in the theater in telling their their, their stories, our stories, uh, it's very effective, but it's not on a global level because the global audience is not coming to theater in our region to be exposed to this. Even to a certain extent, not even the independent films. There are a lot of good independent films that show Palestine in, in a way or another. Uh, Hany Abu Asad, for example, with Paradise Now and Omar and others. Um, but I don't think they are. This is still a very artistic, limited people where you go to festivals, you're nominated for an Oscar. People, are, But it's not the public like. It's not a billboard on La Brea here in Hollywood where Fauda is there every single month whenever there is a new season or something. You know what I mean? I did, so, yes. I get it. We don't have that. We don't have that level of, of let's say, commitment, whether in writing, whether in production, whether in, uh, in even in, in, in acting in our region in order for us to have something could be commercially feasible for the Arab world. I still think the most successful TV show that we had growing up was uh, Rafat al-Hajjan, which I can't translate his name, but Rafat al-Hajjan was uh, supposedly an Egyptian spy in Israel, which is supposed to be a true story. And it could be commercially feasible, but we're not doing that. We're not really telling that. We're also filled with anger that we're not telling the story, it, it, like we have, as Palestinians, one of our definitions is rage. 
like we're we have that rage born into into us as we grow up it's like we're just angry and sometimes that comes up in in a, in, a, in a piece where if the audience doesn't understand that rage it's not acceptable because there's a lot of build up to get to the what we end up saying it so if, if i'm expressing myself to another arab they know exactly the anger that i have but we're not like Hulda, i asked them they were just like sometimes they show that the palestinian terrorist is supposed to have a good point why he became a terrorist they show some sort of a balance but always make sure that you are sympathizing more with israel and that makes it an and um sorry i just keep going here but aaron sorkin uh one of the uh, really great actor uh, writers of a uh, screenplay and he will always say i always write every character as if they're making their case to God why they should be admitted into heaven. Wow. And that's the most powerful thing because every time you hear the uh, antagonist, you're, huh, he has a point in a way. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of good writing versus for us, wow. we show the enemy, we show, it, uh, show them as evil. They could be, but if you don't show them as human, the neutral audience is not engaging. Understood. Understood. Wow, this is such a big topic. And we're going to come back to it in just a minute because I want to know how Casting Arabia is going to solve this. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, all right. Um, Aliyah, my love, how are you? Um, you know, I am so thrilled to be working with you right now. We're working on a project together and I'm, I'm so happy. Uh, your theater work has been very focused on Palestine. And I remember that when we put Arab Voices, Stories of Palestine together in Beirut uh, in 2018 with uh, incorporating translations by E.S. Yunus, um, your decision to direct and present foot by your cousin, Chile-based Palestinian American playwright, Ismail Halidi in Palestinian Arabic translated by E.S. so that it could be performed by Palestinian actors, Ode Kedeze and Omar Ahmad, and beautifully performed, just heartbreaking. Um, and you did it at Dar al Nimr, which is where our kind of our home base for Arab voices. And you took it to the Palestinian camps in around and around Beirut. And I remember that you were very moved by the experience of taking the play to the camps uh, directly to Palestinian audiences. Um, and I, I'm hoping you you will expand on that initiative. I think you are. And if you could talk a little bit about that, about the significance of being Palestinian, living in Lebanon, making theater in Lebanon and around the world, and and wanting to specifically reach Palestinian audience, uh, audiences and employ Palestinian actors and tell Palestinian stories. Can you talk about that? Yes. First of all, thank you very much for hosting me. I love this initiative. Thank you, Sahar, and everybody who put this thing together and made it happen. Um, uh, absolutely, yes. So we we uh, directed the play Foot by Ismail Khalidi, and then we took it to the Burj al Brajni camp. And yes, it was a very emotional experience because the play is about a Palestinian footballer who is shot by um, uh, the Israeli military. So the young men who were there were extremely emotional about it because they they almost wanted to say, you know, get up and say, that's not fair, you know, like because he he falls on stage slowly and they wanted to just bring him back to life. It was very emotional in that respect. But I just want to say a couple of things about um, the whole idea of taking place to the Palestinian camps. As a Lebanese living, as a Palestinian living in Lebanon, um, I have not, I do not come from camp, uh, uh, you know, dwellings. I, I live outside the camp, but I believe that it's extremely important for us not to treat the camp people as like people who live in a you know a, a shelter or a home or because palestinians in lebanon have been living here for 76 years and it is time that they you know consider themselves part of this society 
unfortunately, we have been subjected to so much like inherited trauma from, uh, from the Lebanese war, which has made the Palestinians want to stick, you know, like be confined in, in their camps. And this is the reason why, because I mean, if they venture out of the camps, one of the, the, the plays I did, Al Mahluta, was about um, promoting a mental health clinic, which actually opened right outside the camp. So they had they commissioned me to do a whole play to convince people that it's okay to walk outside the camp and go to that clinic. I'm not saying that applies to everybody. I'm saying there is a wide, you know, there's a large number of people in the camp who still find it not comfortable coming out of the camp. And this is this is something that is very important. Yes, we will continue to take plays into the camps because of that reason, but it's about time that people in the camps, the, I mean, the, the reason why they don't is because they may be walking down the street and be, and stopped by a policeman and, you know, randomly. So they have confined themselves more and more, which is <clears throat> not, uh, not the solution. Uh, but I just wanted to point that out because, yes, it is very emotionally moving. We have taken, I'm sure Raida has taken a lot of her plays to the camps as well. And there is a completely different interaction. Women would, would uh, uh, you know, shout out uh, when we were doing a Yubi directed by Awad Awad. Women would stand up and shout out and say, kill him, kill him, you know, right there. So this is something you don't find in 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 theaters around uh, beirut so i i think taking these plays to the camps <clears throat> does have a great impact but at the same time i feel it's time the you know the lebanese camps the palestinian camps in lebanon are not that restricted and and confined to themselves yeah you know i briefly had the experience uh, at sunflower of giving a workshop for young people uh, who came out of the camp, yeah? And they came to Sunflower and we did workshops, uh, which was very fulfilling. They were so excited because um, they had been apparently doing some theater, some of them before they came to Lebanon. And so it was uh, a, a tremendous uh, release for them, especially because I work so physically. So they were, they really had a good time, I think. And I. I, I really had a sense that it was uh, an important moment for them to be engaging in something they loved outside of the camp. Um, you know, I just wanna um, go back uh, to Raida for a moment and um, wonder, Raida, if you could share, so, cause you've now been all over the world. Well, you, you all three have, but I, 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 you know, you've taken your um, solo work in particular to various countries and um, in, including New York and cities in Europe and so on. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your experience, what the, what's the word, the, um, the interaction has been, the, the, the response, but also your response to being in that situation and giving, uh, telling your stories in a place like Columbia University in New York City. Um, you know, I just would love to hear about that and, uh, and, and whether it is, moving forward this newest urgency of reaching and inspiring the Palestinian community and also telling the story of what's going on. Um, how do you feel about coming to New York, coming, going to Europe and telling those stories as well? Well, uh, one has to be really, really courageous and um, <laughs> not only courageous, but patient. Because every time we talk about the Palestinian cause, um, uh, be it in a theater piece or, or a discourse or a film, or it's always as if it's the first time, you know? Like you're way behind to uh, make people understand and uh, have a different um, point of view or a different, like a, my dream was always uh, uh, to have a paradigm shift about us Palestinians, you know, because we always start from the beginning. We always, I feel like we always try to convince others of our stories, of our uh, injustice, of our, uh, um, uh, 
the atrocities that uh, we have been subjugated to. Um, after 7 October, I uh, I don't feel like explaining myself a lot anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, things have completely changed um, despite all the, um, the, um, the hard times and the, uh, the uh, you know, the difficult times we're going through. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about um, uh, my experience in America was very different from Europe. Um, when I went to the Kennedy Center, and I have performed in many places in America, not only the, the Kennedy Center, I was asked, uh, what is it uh, about America that is different from where um, you were a student? Because I was graduated from George Mason University. And one of uh, a, a woman from the audience stood up and she said, what have changed? I said, I'm sorry, but I have to tell you what, I, what have, have, have changed. Uh, when I came as a student, I was like 18, 17 or 18 years old, and people would ask me, where do you come from? And I would tell them Palestine, and they would say, Pakistan. Oh, we know Pakistan. I would tell them, no, no, Palestine is different. Um, after 30, 40 years, okay, now they know where Palestine is. <laughs> that has changed a little bit. And, uh, but like I told you, um, one has to be uh, very patient because it's one form of crucial resistance. Um, when, you, when you talk, I mean, when you have the Palestinian narrative and you travel with it and you have so many stories to tell, it'll get there one day. I, I am a very patient uh, human being, you know, I'm a patient person concerning this only. In Europe, it's different. <laughs> In Europe, is different. They know history more. And you can see sometimes, um, like in, in, in London or in, in Austria or in France, um, people know about you. I mean, they know about our cause, but they choose their love or hatred to you. They're either with you or against you. I mean, uh, and it goes simultaneously with, with politics. Because mm -hmm. um, uh, my... my my narrative, my plays are are completely connected to the political situation of 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 the Palestinians. I mean, this is a de facto. Uh, you cannot mention any story without mentioning the the occupation or um, that people are subjected to the all the atrocity. You cannot. I mean, you just cannot have one fun play. Uh, 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 going on that same wavelength. You know, it's like a roller coaster but <clears throat> but it's always interesting and it's always uh, fun is not the word but it's always uh, uh, challenging you know fun of course but challenging you know to meet uh, uh, new people and uh, to see these people are changing their 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 views they are learning more about you and they keep in touch they keep contact uh, you know, in touch with you, they keep in contact with you. Uh -huh. I managed to change few, <clears throat> a few, um, uh, few people. You know, their their the way they think. I think if I can change ten or fifteen in my lifetime, <laughs> it spreads out. It spreads yeah. out. Yeah. No, but that's hey, interesting. Thing? Go ahead, sweetheart. Go ahead. One, yeah, one thing I want to talk about the camps. Uh, Alia was mentioning that people are really. Um, um, confined and they don't want to, uh, uh, you know, leave the camp. Uh, well, I think it's it's a very complicated uh, issue here. If we want to if we want to uh, uh, discuss it in length, these people have inherited uh, their traumas from their um, um, from their grandfathers and grandparents. Okay, not only that, they are not welcomed in the society. And they don't feel secure. They are insecure. They don't feel safe. They are not welcome. I mean, some of the camps have a check post. You know, you cannot go enter the camp in Nahar al-Barid unless you have a permission. Uh, if you are, if you don't have a Lebanese uh, passport, um, so uh, these people, you know, it's it's really shameful at this time to have camps like this. It's it's really shameful to have camps like this now, and it always made me feel. 
um, uh, uh, intimidated because these people, uh, when they were expelled from Palestine, they left their real houses, their lands, and their trees. They were not, uh, you know, they left with nothing, but they had everything, you know. And uh, I'm always joyed, you know, I want them to come. And they, 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 a few times they have come to for my place and they have watched uh, uh, my place through the Hassan Kanafani Foundation. But I, I feel honored and sad, honored yet sad uh, uh, when I go to the camps and perform uh, my plays. They are great listeners, by the way, great, yeah. great listeners. It's like little Palestine, and you know, unfortunately, with such uh, horrible uh, uh, life conditions. But yeah. uh, they are intimidated. They are not allowed to get out of the camps. I mean, they don't feel secure 100%. And I understand them, you know. I but Leah, did you want to chime in on that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, that that is exactly what I was trying to say. It's not a matter of that they confine themselves, uh, uh, you know, willingly. It is the inherited trauma from the Lebanese war that has really put so much strain on them. I spoke to a student yesterday who's a new nursing student at a very you know, reputable, uh, one of the best universities in Lebanon. And he said, when some students find out that he is Palestinian, they pack up their stuff and leave. It is that terrible. That, that, yeah, it is really. Um, some of them are curious and ask him, oh, well, can I come to your camp? I want to see it and so on. But there is still this terrible, uh, uh, what can I call it? It's, it's like, uh, you know, the, the inherited trauma that they have taken from their parents, from their grandparents, about the Lebanese war that has allowed these other Lebanese to decide that these people are almost, you know, um, like specimens of people who who exist in places. And this is exactly what we really have to get rid of and 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 start talking about more and more. I'm talking in terms of Lebanon because this is really very important, especially well, now. Fair, there fair are enough. People... Yeah, and I. You and know I'm, what's I'm, the I'm, only. I'm, I'm... What's the only solution for this? Sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Um, after 75, 76 year, uh, si six years, you know, more than 75 years, the only uh, recipe is liberation. It's about time for these people to go back to their country and to their habitat. The liberation. Yeah. That's all. Absolutely. This is the recipe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, indeed, indeed. And Leah, I, I just want to, because I was going to ask you a little bit about this too. Uh, so we're doing a staged presentation of Food and Fadwa in Eos's translation. Um, and the actors will be working entirely in Arabic, mm -hmm. and which is a beautiful thing. And you are insistent that the actors playing these mm -hmm. roles will be Palestinian, which I love. That's awesome. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering what the impact of that presentation could be on young people that we bring in to come and hear the reading, hear, see the play, meet with the actors after the reading. I'm just, you know, brainstorming now too, but I'm thinking, is that an opportunity to inspire, to know that all the actors, the brilliant actors you're watching right now are all Palestinian? Yes, uh, it is very significant because I think from 19, uh, 20, 2010, when Lina Abiyad directed uh, Return to Haifa by Hassan Kanafani, in which both me and Raida acted, uh, it, it, was, it was one of the early, uh, I would say, commercial plays that was put in on uh, stage, stage in, in Beirut, where people heard the Palestinian accent. And that is when uh, you could feel people in the audience saying, now that's beautiful. She's speaking yeah. in Palestinian. So, uh, and this is all related to the, you know, 1975 until today, trauma that, that you know, even the Palestinian uh, 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 dialect, dialect. dialect is, is actually, uh, people stop 
you know, are trying to cover their Palestinian dialect because they need to integrate more into society. But okay. um, what I what I want to say about this is that since then there have been many plays. One I directed, which Raida also acted in, and then Raida's one uh, uh, woman uh, performances, and then Awad Awad's performance that's also in Palestinian dialect. This is happening more and more recently, and it has to happen more often, right? Uh, Raida, what did you have? Yes, to sure, right. But I insisted on your eighty steps to be a, 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 to be Lamia who speaks the dialect, the Palestinian dialects, and who comes from Jaffa. You know, I insisted on that, and this was my condition. <laughs> I remember. I remember. This, this actually takes me back to Eos, okay? Because, um, of course, he has been, um, you know, uh, embroiled, I should say, or he's gone down a rabbit hole of uh, <laughs> translating plays for the next Arab Voices yeah. project, and in which he is translating from English into different dialects, which I know is a, is a real challenge. I mean, generally speaking, uh, maybe not for you, Mr. Genius, but I'm just saying. And, uh, and it, it just, it, now it takes me back to the, to the topic of, and we only have a few minutes left, but translation, accents and casting, okay? So talking about casting, talking about casting Arabia, what does it mean, for example, to have a platform that bring, that um, raises up uh, Arab actors, especially um, speaking, you know, Arabic, but not exclusively, right? Because a lot of actors are bilingual and can, you know, and so maybe they're speaking English in a particular film, but they're speaking from a Palestinian perspective. So they have the accent, et cetera. Correct. Talk about casting Arabia with regard to that, if you don't mind. Of course. Uh, thank you for asking this. So the, the idea in general, uh, since I started acting, I've always felt that it's all about bridging the gap. So it's always with a translation, especially, it's also bridging the, the gap, not only from a language perspective, but also bridging that cultural gap. And the only play, although like, I translate for everything that you mentioned, Ra'ida is the only one who I translated from Arabic to English, by the way. <laughs> uh, it was a very cool experience. Uh, the casting, what I've noticed that we have in terms what we're, what a lot of things that are missing for us. And again, I'm not talking about theater. I'm talking about mostly because the theater, as I said, it's kind of limited in its, uh, scope because it's limited physically with the people who can attend at a certain time versus streaming and everything else now just opened the chance for a lot of stories to be discussed globally. Um, Casting Arabia evolved because I realized how much the networking is missing and how many projects that I've seen in the region that are miscast because of the limited number of people who know about it. So there is the two, well, basically two way, two things that are missing were basically the network and the awareness. The third thing is the education. So a lot of people have the talent, but they don't, they, they haven't, they don't, they're, they never been trained in it. Whether it's talent in writing, whether it's talent in uh, in acting, or any other talent that is needed for the performing arts, so I decided to create the platform in order to bridge that gap and also to network people together. So, technology is what's helping in expediting and increase the efficiency of this. So, what we have, I took the example of the 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 model that is in the United States. Versus going to a mom and pop shop where you call someone is like, hey, Abu Muhammad, like, do you have someone to play this role or whatever? And it's like, yeah, well, I have three people in files that I've been working with for the past 20 years. Well, we need more people and you need other people as well. So the idea is to have this, I, don't, I hate this word, database, but having all these talents, especially Palestinians, especially people who are unfortunate, everyone has a phone. Whether you're in a camp, whether you're anywhere else, even if you're in Lebanon and the project is filming in Morocco, if I give you the chance with a click of a button to submit your profile, which is very simple and it's free with a picture and your resume and every, everything that you've done to submit and have the chance to be maybe with Ridley Scott in Morocco. 
that is an achievement. And also having competition with writers where you can have all those people who don't know where to take their script is to, to submit it and have some sort of a competition where you have a committee that judges. And I was on multiple of those as a writer as well, where we had a competition judging different scripts and we voted and the ones who won actually got funding. So, and the same thing with theater and other things. So whether it's theater, whether it's TV, film, the idea is to create this big network of people and mostly doing it for free. Obviously there are ways of making money through that in somehow, but the essence of it is that you have all the talent creating profiles, submitting for jobs. Everyone who's looking for talent can post for free. So this way we create, we let technology help us with an app. And by the way, it's functioning. So we have, I think about now, we launched beginning of the year. We have 3,400 people now. We're having new subscribers about 10 or 20 a day. And I am barely spending money on marketing now, but it's mostly content, educational content. I teach how to audition. I teach things about screenwriting teaching things about the history of cinema as well as like, how did it evolve? Why? And in, uh, also it, it's the cool thing is when you open it up to the public, like, what do you think? And you hear their opinions. I was like, well, I like this style. I like this. Well, there is the Meisner technique. There is this technique in acting. What do you think? And then they just pitch in. So there's a lot of talent, a lot of ambition and will to be in the arts. But mm -hmm. there's a there's a lack of knowing how to join, and there's a lack of knowing what it is. Acting versus stardoms, like you can be a great actor but not a star. So it's like you need to let them understand that. And there is a certain structure for writing. It's just you don't just go and say whatever you're thinking. That's actually more like a composition, an essay versus an actual structure of a play or something. Whereas you have the three acts or whatever you want to follow. So this is the That's project amazing. and this is how, and, how far we're going with it. And so I'm just going to say right now that people who are listening um, need to uh, Google you, yes, Eunice, and also Casting Arabia. And you do yeah. actually a marvelous, uh, there's a wonderful YouTube video, I think it's YouTube, uh, in which you're talking about the platform, its origins and what is possible and so on. And um, yeah, and uh, and uh, we're going to we're gonna zoom you into... Uh, Arab Voices in September, so you can tell people oh, yeah. what's, go what's going on. Uh, I, I want to yeah. just move to, uh, I want to hear uh, just a, a bit from Raida mm. and Aliyah about your what you're doing next. Uh, and Aliyah, in particular, uh, just talk for a moment, if you don't mind, about the Foundation for Arab Dramatic Arts. Uh, muted. For a moment. It's going to take a lot more than a moment to talk about the foundation. Yes. Well, so we only have a couple minutes left. So, okay. But so um, uh, we have just established a foundation called Foundation for Arab Dramatic Arts, which is an archiving platform where we will be archiving the history of Arabic theater or theater in Lebanon and the Arab world. And this uh, is, is going to be on two kind of um, parallel ways. We will be archiving material, uh, archiving, which means that books and papers and you know, uh, newspaper cuttings and, stuff, and videos and, and recording, sound recordings and uh, radio interviews and all that. And the other section is going to be live archiving. And live archiving means that we bring in the people who have stories to tell, to tell their stories of their experience in theater, but to a live audience. So then we record that and put it on our, uh, you know, digital, on, on our website and all our, you know, social media. And this way we won't, we won't leave, I mean, we don't, won't, won't leave untold stories because the untold stories, some people don't sit down and write their own stories or they don't have time. And instead of 
recording them in a room with a white background and just to tell it, you know, telling us their story, they're interacting with a live audience. That's beautiful. So, that is beautiful. I would, so I hope that I, I can be present for one of those, honestly. That is just amazing, Aliyah. And you have such a good group of people working on it with you, like Dima and Walid and others. Yeah. Um, so lastly, uh, say one yeah. thing about uh, we were talking about earlier about um, about the narrative. I mean, Raida uh, spoke a lot about the uh, Palestinian narrative, but I just want to say one thing, which is that what I feel is also missing in our Palestinian narrative is actually telling the real Israeli narrative, which is which which they have sold to the world for many, many years as 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 you know the the their narrative. But we have to start talking about the aggression, the brutality, the in uh, you know the inexplicable evil that is happening uh, throughout yeah, from 76 years until today. Because this yeah. is something that we kind of self-censor ourselves and we say, oh, but, you know, these people have been victimized. We And the Western world says you can't say anything about Israel because, you know, they were like victims of an aggression. Therefore, uh, you know, we got to be very careful about that. Absolutely no. And this uh, is very much what these 24 hours is about, too. Um, and there's uh, more to come. We are only the second session, um, but there are narratives that are being delivered by some of our brilliant Arab American actors in the sessions to come. And I hope you'll check them out. But before we go, Raida, very briefly, you have a beautiful new project that you're talking about doing based on the poetry of who? Tell me the name again. No, I'm not going to say. <laughs> you're not going to say it? No. <laughs> okay, but you're working uh, on working a new project. On a new project. I'm working on a new project. Uh, um, uh, usually I have to digest what's happening, you know, in, uh, in, in any story, in any uh, um, project I get myself involved to, uh, in. Uh, but uh, this project is going, to, uh, it's going to have a very, very new approach. It's about Gaza, but in a very different new approach. Okay, I, I hope it'll work. I'm working very hard on that. And I'm working uh, on a documentary about my father. Uh, <clears throat> um, 50 years, 52 years of, the, of hijacking uh, uh, his plane. But uh, this, docu this documentary will be about uh, hijacking. You know, okay. one of them will be Ali Taha and uh, and other hijackers. Or yeah, I'm in the process of doing that. And concerning the Israeli narrative, Aliya, um, you know, because I talk about that, and a lot of people talk about that. Uh, about that, uh, a lot of people are being censored from the Arab world, to be honest with you, or even censored from Europe uh, to present such uh, a very strong narrative that cannot. Our narrative cannot be excluded uh, from uh, the atrocities that the, the Israelis uh, um, uh, yeah, subjugate us to. In every story, there is uh, Israel and the occupation. In every single story, I doubt that there is narrative without mentioning the occupation. I doubt. Understood. Understood, Raida. And now we really do need to move on to the next session. So. This is the moment when I say goodbye to my very dear friends and thank you with all of my heart, from the bottom of my heart for this conversation. Thank you for joining. Thank you for reading your narrative, Raida. And, uh, and it's just, just the tip of the iceberg and we know that, but that's yeah. why they're planning 24 hours. Yes. <laughs> so that yes. more territory can be covered. Thank you all so much. Thank and you. Such a great initiative. Thank you. Thank Beautiful. you very much. Beautiful. Thank you for having us. I love you Bye -bye. all. Bye. Uh, you and now, Take care. moving forward, um, I'm um, going to uh, welcome Sahar Asaf, Executive Artistic Director of Golden Thread Productions, who will present the third session in 24 Hours for Palestine. It's called Gaza Now, Witnessing the Witnesses. Welcome, Sahar and company. <laughs> 